Oh God, this is bad. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's video, we'll be reviewing Pamela Reef and her wellness app, Pam app. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, Nectar. So you guys know I am really picky about my bedtime routine. I'm literally like the princess and the pea, where if one teeny tiny little detail of my night is off, I risk being up all night long. So I was really excited and kind of anxious about trying my new Nectar mattress. And I gotta tell you, I totally see what all the fuss is about. This is an award-winning 14-inch gel memory foam mattress with three supportive layers to help prevent sinking, contour to your unique body, and keep you cool. And I run really hot, so a cool mattress is really key for me. I also love that the foam they use is Certipure US certified, so it's free of ozone depleters. Honestly, I've always said that your mattress choice is so important considering that you spend half of your life on it. So it is worth investing in something that you love. So if you're in the market for a new mattress, Nectar actually has a 365 night trial, a forever warranty and free shipping and returns. So for more information on Nectar, check out my link in the description. Now, as always, you can pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. I will be talking calories and macros, so feel free to skip that portion if it is not supportive to your journey. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on an episode. Okay, friends, let's begin with a little background on Pamela Reef. So Pamela is Germany's leading fitness and food influencer. You may know her from her popular killer home workout videos, which certainly came in clutch mid pandemic. But unless you are an avid Pam Stan, you may not know that she's also a major foodie. She's even in the process of developing a new cookbook and has recently launched the Pam app where she shares workout routines, nutrition and wellness blog posts, recipes, and meal plans. Since the launch of the app, I have been overwhelmed with DMs and comments. You know your DMs will be blowing up. Damn. Asking me to review it and also flagging some of her messaging around her diet. So I downloaded the app to give you my honest thoughts. All right, so let's start with a quick overview of what Pam's app has to offer. So for $3 a month or $30 a year, the Pam app offers fitness videos, healthy recipes, and wellness tips. The app also includes a shopping list feature, exercise scheduler, and for an additional fee, you can also add the recipes from her previously published cookbook. The recipes and information provided through the app centers around quick and easy homemade meals that take into consideration environmental sustainability and affordability which are attributes that we love to see. And at face value, this all sounds great, but obviously I had to dive a little bit deeper and it wasn't long before I hit a treasure trove of diet culture rhetoric in the app store description. And I hadn't even downloaded it yet. So Pamela says that her recipes replace the bad ingredients in classic recipes. Her recipes do not include a lot of fat or sugar because it's not aligned with a fit lifestyle. And she also says that her job is to have a flat tummy and toned thighs, which isn't even that hard. I'm sorry, that isn't even that hard? Now, in all fairness, it's quite possible some of the questionable wording used may be just attributed to translation challenges, but I do believe that language is powerful and important here, especially when talking about wellness and health. So if you're going to launch your program in English speaking countries, hire an English speaking copywriter to just check it over so that you don't end up with that. Yikes, not good. It's quite clear to me just from a quick glimpse at this description that Pam has a tendency to subscribe to a very black and white dichotomous view of food. And interestingly, this seems at odds with her own suggestion that she eats intuitively herself. I also have to say that I feel a little cheated after seeing language like this, considering that her food Instagram account looks so freaking good, but it's really disappointing that those delicious looking snacks and desserts and meals 
are needing to be accompanied by this kind of restrictive and problematic rhetoric. I also just need to flag that Pam's suggestion that it's not that hard to have a body like hers is not only misleading and disheartening, but it's also factually wrong. Pam is a 24 year old fitness influencer. Her body is likely the result of an extremely active lifestyle, a restrictive diet and lucky genetics. Not to mention that most women need to get down below 20% of body fat to see ab definition. And most women also need over 20% body fat to maintain normal menstruation and hormone function. So please do not be discouraged if you are putting in the work and you don't look like Pam as a result. It might not even be healthy for you. But anyways, moving on, let's take a look at the recipes in the Pam app. So first off, I wanna talk about the good. All of the nutrition details that I mentioned in this video are based off of the stats listed on the app. But what I love is that these numbers are located on a separate tab from the recipes themselves. And the app encourages subscribers to ignore this information if it's not supportive to their health. This to me is probably one of the best and most thoughtful attributes of the Pam app itself. But don't get too excited here, folks, because there's a lot not to love as well. Huge disappointment. So everything on the Pam app is dairy-free, fish-free, and wheat-free, and there's limited meat offerings and soy offerings. And that is totally cool. And also it does make sense since Pamela herself adheres to these dietary restrictions largely apparently due to environmental and animal welfare concerns. On her blog, she does suggest that she tries not to impose these restrictions on others and instead encourages her fans to choose more sustainable options if they are going to eat meat. And ultimately, I do appreciate that statement. So now I wanna to touch on what Pam allegedly eats in a day as per her app, and also discuss some of those diet restrictions that I just mentioned. First of all, Pam says she does not consume soy products due to her belief that they can mess up our hormone balance because of their isoflavone content. So this is a tremendously complicated topic, so I'm gonna to try to keep it light. But the isoflavones found in soy are selective estrogen reception modulators, which means that sometimes they can have either a weak estrogenic effect or sometimes they can actually have an anti-estrogenic effect. Confusing, I know. I would need a whole video to go through this, but in short, a meta-analysis found that soy consumption had no impact on thyroid health, nor does consuming normal amounts of it cause male feminization or increase the risk of breast cancer. In fact, one meta-analysis even suggested that it might reduce that risk. But like I said, this is super complicated, so I'm gonna link to a blog post below um, that I wrote on this topic. But I'll also just say that avoiding soy in addition to all other animal products and wheat definitely will make it more challenging to get in a nice variety of protein and iron sources in her day. Now, in addition to soy, another big Pam no-no is wheat, which I just mentioned, which she states is a personal preference, but then also she reveals that she believes wheat is empty carbohydrates, along with her other arch nemesis, sugar. So as a result, most of Pam's recipes feature gluten-free grains or pseudo grains, and she uses coconut blossom sugar to sweeten. My take is that sugar is sugar is sugar. Yes, something like coconut sugar has a marginally lower glycemic index, with researchers at the University of Sydney reporting a GI value of 54, which is only slightly better than white sugar's rating of 65. It's also more than 10 times the price. But ultimately, both have 15 calories and four grams of carbs per teaspoon, and both should be enjoyed in moderation. So I say choose a sweetener that you actually enjoy and move on with your life. But let's take a look at her day. So for breakfast, most days, Pam has some sort of oatmeal bowl combining some whole grains, fruits, and nuts. One of her favorites is a sweet scrambled egg recipe with banana and coconut, which I know sounds kind of strange, but I actually have made sweet eggs before myself, and I personally love the technique. It's not unlike my famous whipped proats recipe that everyone is obsessed with, and in Pamela's case, I love that we have some protein and fat in the eggs, carbs in the banana, and fiber and fat in the coconut. 
It's also a hearty portion at over 500 calories, so I would bet that this would keep someone pretty satisfied. Now, baked oatmeal is another breakfast staple of Pam's, and one really delicious example is her choco peanut butter lava porridge. Oh my gosh, it looks so good. So this one has fiber-rich carbs from the whole grain oats, protein the healthy fats from the peanut butter, carbs from the banana, super delicious, and of course some chocolate in there for good measure, love it. Now it is worth pointing out though that when we calculated the macros on this, it clocked in at significantly less protein than what the app actually listed. So I'm not sure, but there may be some inconsistencies in that, or maybe the ingredients that she uses are very different than what we find in North America. But regardless, it does have the hunger crushing combo and it looks super tasty. So yeah, I'm definitely giving this one a try. Now, I also noticed that she often uses sweet potato as a non-bread alternative to whole grain toast, but acknowledges that this is not a substitute, but rather a good alternative. So I do like this sentiment. It is refreshing to see since a lot of influencers insinuate that there's something inherently bad about having like a piece of actual real bread. But I do think this really does come down to intention and again, the language we use. Diet culture would say sweet potatoes are toast because eating real bread is bad for you. But a more morally neutral way of looking at this would be to say, hey, you know, it's not bread. It is in fact a sweet potato made into the shape of toast and I can enjoy both of them or one more than the other when I'm craving like a different nutrition and sensory experience. Both are delicious and both are nutritious options to keep in the rotation. So again, language and intention are really, really key to help keep us out of scarcity mentality with these kind of wellness food swaps. Now, moving on to lunch, Pam often has like a grain-based bowl or a salad, like this whole grain spelt pasta with a creamy veggie sauce made with carrots, potatoes, and water. She then tops it off with tomatoes, olives, and turkey bacon for a little protein and fat. Again, another beautifully balanced meal with a solid 20 grams of protein. And I really like using meat as more of like a garnish than the main dish which I think is particularly beneficial when we're using like a higher sodium processed meat like bacon. I generally do try to think about serving meat this way, AKA what I call conda meat. As for the spelt pasta, it does have slightly more protein and fiber than regular whole wheat pasta. And it is only a little bit more expensive per 100 grams. So as long as Pam enjoys the swap, I think it does make sense. Now, when we get to dinner, we notice that Pam usually tends to keep her evening meals pretty light and low carb. So for example, her peanut butter chicken with veggies sounds delicious, and it does pack a solid amount of protein, healthy fats, and some fiber in the veg. But we could definitely add in like a side of rice, sweet potatoes, or another whole grain, just to really help bump up the satisfaction factor. Another dinner favorite is her shakshuka, which has a solid 26 grams of protein from eggs simmered in a tomato passata sauce. But again, we would definitely wanna see some carb action going on. So I would probably do like a nice hearty sourdough bread or some gluten-free pita, just to sop up that delicious, yummy sauce. Finally, let's talk dessert. So Pam usually ends the day with something sweet. Often it's like a small date nut based ball, some avocado chocolate mousse, or her healthified carrot cake. Now, while I am all for more nutrient dense takes on dessert, and I myself make chocolate avocado mousse for my toddler all the time. I was kind of annoyed with Pam's disclaimer on the recipe that it does not contain a trace of regular chocolate and that she will even leave out the dates from time to time to enjoy a 100% clean fitness appropriate dessert. Yeah, I don't know who needs to hear this, but dates can absolutely be part of a fitness influencer's diet. Anyways, she also suggests that the carrot cake I mentioned could be turned into a cheat, depending on your sugar preference. So 
yeah, that kind of put a sour taste in my mouth and really made me lose my appetite for said desserts. But anyways, let's talk about the stats here. Now, according to an Instagram q and I read from Pam, Pam says she no longer counts calories as she is back to intuitive eating, but she thinks that she eats between 1800 calories and 2200 calories per day. I would say even if that were true, it would very likely not even be enough for a woman her side doing the activity that she does every day. When I actually calculated her weekly sample menu, her intake ranged from about 1,350 to 1,550 calories, AKA just not enough. Her protein came in at 16% of her daily calories, carbs at 38% and fat at 44%, which definitely puts her on the low end for protein and carbs for someone in the fitness community. I would definitely be worried about optimal pre-workout fuel and post-workout recovery on a diet as restrictive as this. So let's talk about a few things that I would suggest we focus on to help her better meet her daily needs. Now, while I am generally really happy to see Pamela eating solid, balanced daytime meals with healthy portions, I do think we could really bump up that dinner with a solid serving of carbs. So something like potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, or a non-wheat grain if she doesn't do wheat, and then also focus on adding in a few balanced snacks in between those meals. So this would definitely help with post-workout recovery and also ensure that she's eating enough calories, carbs, and protein to meet her needs. Now, when I went through a recipe repertoire looking for some other options that were maybe higher in protein specifically, I actually found that most of her snacks only offered between three to 10 grams, which is not a lot. So since Pam has so many dietary restrictions being pretty much fully plant-based with no wheat or soy, it definitely whittles down our options for quality protein. So if she insisted on maintaining some of these additional restrictions, I would probably recommend a non-soy plant-based protein powder as a post-workout snack. Okay, now I do wanna focus my critique here on Pamela's attitude towards food and her body because that's where most of your comments came in about. So first of all, I think it's telling that her family has apparently nicknamed her the ingredient police. I don't know, but if you ask me, considering there is a whole chapter in the intuitive eating book on how to reject the food police, I can't say that this is compatible with Pamela's assertion that she is eating intuitively now. Second, I wanna revisit the moralizing language Pam assigns to food. So Pam often talks about the naturalness or clean quality of her ingredients. She also suggests cleaning out any processed or convenience foods in the house that don't meet her clean, all natural food standards. I personally don't think that this is a sustainable option for most people, and it just makes healthy eating more elitist and inaccessible. I always say that if a convenience item helps you get a relatively balanced family meal on the table, then this is a great healthy tool to lean on. In other words, if store-bought dressing means your kids eat their greens, bust out that bottled ranch. I like to think about how these little kitchen helpers can actually help to boost the nutrient quality of our diet overall by making naturally nourishing foods more enjoyable. And leaning on these tools are particularly important for feeding kids, but also for adults as well. Now, I also noticed that Pamela makes a bunch of contradictory statements like, not everyone feels guilty after having a burger, you shouldn't anyway, as well as, you can eat sweets once in a while, but then juxtaposes that against calling Black Forest cake something that definitely hits your hips, and saying, cravings don't come from too few calories, we definitely eat enough of those. Um, as we established, lady, not everyone is eating enough of those. She also feels very strongly about calling sugar empty calories and saying you won't get abs from sugar. Again, that is factually wrong. Ask an athlete if they eat simple carbohydrates and they will absolutely tell you yes, yes they do. Sugar is our body's preferred energy source and is often used in competitive and aesthetic sports to help drive protein into the muscle fast. Sugar is also just a simple form of carbohydrate. It's literally just a macronutrient, 
Why do we need to demonize that? Not to mention, it makes zero sense to me to make a huge fuss over white sugar, but then just use a ton of maple syrup and coconut flour sugar in its place. No, no, he's got a point. Well, anyways, aside from the moralizing language around food, I also uncovered a lot of pseudoscience Easter eggs just hidden in that little blog of hers that desperately need to be debunked. For example, Pam suggests that Himalayan salt does not cause water retention and regular table salt cannot be properly absorbed by the body. So the truth is that while Himalayan salt has slightly less sodium for equal weight, Research shows that both table salt and Himalayan sea salt help participants reach their sodium recommendation. In other words, they both contain plenty of salt, enough to cause retention if consumed in excess. And while yes, pink salt does contain more minerals than refined table salt, you would have to consume a ton to get any kind of meaningful amount. Please, please, please do not try to meet your calcium needs through added salt. Pam is also a fan of the food combining diet. Which you know I have already discussed ad nauseum, but for some reason this bullshit just refuses to die. So this grossly misinformed diet supposes, for example, that you need to eat fruit before other foods and also to eat it on an empty stomach to prevent a traffic jam that inhibits normal digestion. Folks, this is not true. Our digestive system is much more advanced than Pamela is suggesting. It is expertly designed to send out an ideal mix of enzymes to digest whatever food or mix of foods find their way into our gut. We don't have to like time it out or combine them in any specific way. The only food combinations that are evidence-based are things like adding protein, fat, or fiber to your meal to up the satiety factor and reduce the blood sugar response, or things like combining vitamin C and iron to improve absorption. But these food combining rules are total BS. Next, okay, another bogus food rule that she promotes is not to drink water a half an hour before a meal, during a meal, or upwards of an hour following a meal. And as someone who eats three meals and at least one snack a day, though I would love to see that bumped up, there isn't a lot of time left for hydration. So many people struggle to maintain their hydration status. So this just really adds an extra unnecessary obstacle for people to get their fix. So since she's clearly so concerned with digestion and bloating, she should probably know that dehydration is probably one of the most surefire ways to back yourself up. And while it's often suggested that drinking water at meals waters down your digestive enzymes, the evidence that we have has really proven this to be false. Even if it did have an effect, our body would compensate by just making more enzymes. It's really truly amazing how intuitive our body really is. And I also wanna discuss the suggestion of her naturopathic doctor who told Pamela that a cold drink is comparable to pouring cold water on a grill, so you need to heat up the grill all over again before it will work properly. Um, no. Your body actually has a pretty powerful internal temperature regulation system. If it didn't, Pam would die from eating like a bowl of her udon miso soup or from one of her frozen yogurt slices. So no, you don't have to drink all your fluids warm. And finally, very briefly, Pam also seems to subscribe to the thoroughly debunked alkaline diet. Oh Lord, <sighs> give me strength. So Pamela regularly shares her belief that acidic foods like animal products, wheat, sugar, and milk create an acidic environment that ultimately puts us at risk for disease. In reality, the body actually runs a pretty tight ship to maintain its proper pH balance. If it didn't, we would literally die from eating a piece of citrus fruit. I know this is totally morbid, but there would be a lot of dead wellness influencers out there with all the lemon water that they're drinking. Lemon water. So if this is the true reason behind her diet restrictions, then it's definitely something I would urge her to rethink because she's missing out on a lot of eating experiences and nutrition due to just total BS. Now what bothers me the most is not the misinformation found on Pamela's website and her social properties, which 
let's be real, there's a lot of, but it's because they're peppered throughout all these supportive food freedom messages, which makes it really difficult for the lay person to determine if Pam is supportive of their food journeys or not. So for example, sorting through her blog posts, I see mentions about mindful eating tips, intuitive eating, and supporting local whenever you can. She also discusses a lot of more nutrition science topics like the glycemic index and free radicals. So it's easy to see these kind of buzzy food words and assume that she's an authority on the topic of nutrition and health. But it's important to note that Pamela is not an expert in nutrition. She's not a dietitian. She's not a doctor. She's a beautiful girl with beautifully styled recipes. And I don't know, they probably taste really amazing too. And I've also heard that her workouts are banging, so I'm gonna give her that as well. But in my eyes, she should be seen as a food blogger and a fitness influencer, not someone who should be trusted to be telling them what they should or how they should be eating. So I wanna bring it back to the app because I wanna summarize some of my personal thoughts as a handy dandy pros and cons list to help you decide if this app is worth a buy. So the pros are that the app is pretty affordable in the grand scheme of apps. It has a nice variety of nutritious recipes with adaptable portion sizes, and it offers the convenience of a shopping list, which I love. There are also options for people with different dietary restrictions, and you have the choice to view or ignore the nutrition facts. I also like that there's a lot of information about eating more sustainably. And cons is that a lot of Pam's nutrition content is not evidence-based and could potentially lead to disorderly eating behaviors or investing in unnecessary, inaccessible products. I also find that a lot of the language related to food is quite moralizing, dichotomizing, and ultimately not compatible with the intuitive eating messages that she seems to be pushing as of late. With all this considered, if you're looking for a convenient hub to plan healthy meals and workouts, this app might be a good investment for you. However, I wanna make sure everyone is aware that the information provided is not coming from a nutrition professional, and as a result, contains a good amount of nutrition lies and food fear mongering. And folks, that is all that I have for you guys today. I hope this video was useful in helping you make a more informed decision about whether or not to purchase the PAM app. So if you liked it, be sure to give it the thumbs up Leave me a comment below if you liked this video and what you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.